Hey guys, this is Jennifer from the Shooter's Mindset. We are live with episode 345. Hope everybody's doing well tonight. We have our co-host, Greg Cannon here. How's it going, Greg? Hey, everyone. And we have our guest of the hour is Michael Shea, and he is the author of Rimfire Revolution, which Rimfire is kind of blown up in the last probably two years. Um, kind of really grown. So for anybody that's unfamiliar with you, Michael, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in shooting and kind of came into being a writer. Yeah. So um, thanks for having me, guys. This is this is awesome. I love what you do. Um, so my background, I've kind of always been a writer. It's been the only like real job that I've had. I was a newspaper reporter right out of college. And then I got into outdoor writing. So um, after newspapers, I started working for Field and Stream and Outdoor Life magazines, and then uh, started doing more and more work, freelance work eventually for Field and Stream and Gun Digest and Ducks Unlimited and just all doing the outdoor writer thing. Um, and always hunted. Hunting was kind of my zone, my jam. It still is. It's probably what I spend most of my time doing outside of my my family, obviously. Uh, but I went squirrel hunting with a precision rifle with some buddies and just got hooked. And that was, I think it was about three or four years ago, right around the time like NRL 22 was spinning up. And I just, I think a lot of you guys can relate and people watching this can probably relate, but I just fell down the rabbit hole and just got hooked on these really accurate, really tiny cartridges. And um, the rest is just is just kind of history. I kind of did my writer thing, did my reporter thing, called everyone I knew and asked them about these. And I was lucky because I was writing a lot about this stuff for Field and Stream. So the best minds in the game were just picking up the phone and, and unloading. And uh, about a year ago, I guess it was February, it was a year ago, February, I was like, you know what, I'm going to put this all in one place, you know, and really, I guess, I guess really like the best way to describe it, what I wanted to do is like, when I got hooked on this, I was living in the forums on Sniper's Hide and Rimfire Central and the Facebook Rimfire groups. And I ultimately wanted to pull together like all the precision shooting information that like, I wish I had when I originally got hooked. And that was kind of the mission of the book is like, just put it in one place so if someone's interested in this or if someone wants to elevate their game, they have like a one-stop shop. And it's not be all and end all, but it's, it's definitely, I think, going to give you an edge and save you a lot of time if you're starting from zero or close to zero. It's always great to have a resource to be able to look at and get information. I know when I was getting into shooting, it was like, I mean, yeah, you find a lot of people that hunt, a lot of people that shoot, but trying to find someone local that shot competitively that was willing to put up with my endless questions. Yeah. <laughs> Cause yeah. I had a lot of really dumb ones, <laughs> but you don't know what you don't know. And so trying to learn it and going to matches and asking people and piecing things together. And then, you know, eight months into it being like, Oh, well, if I'd have known that, you know, could have saved yeah. me a lot of trouble you know, along the way. So I think it's great to have a book where you can just get it and read it and get some yeah. answers. Yeah. And, and like I was, because of my work and my job, like I was able to do the research side of it, you know, and collect all this information and do this. But to your point, like nothing beats going to a match. So I actually had to start one. So I start, I still match direct to the NRL 22 match, like a half hour from here at my local gun club. Cause that's another huge piece of it. You know, it's all theoretical until you kind of get on the range, but um, yeah, I had, I had to start my own match to get, to get into it just cause it's, it's not, it hasn't made in waves in the East, like it has in the South or the West. So, so I'm not the only one that when I wanted to shoot rimfire locally, somebody said, Oh yeah, we can do that. We just need a match director and looked at me and I've been doing that. Yeah. That's awesome, man. That's what it takes, you know, like somebody's got to take the initiative and get it going. Um, and now we have like half a dozen to 12 kind of like hardcore guys here in my my uh, little town in rural New York. And um, and they're getting after it, man. And these guys are getting good fast. So, yeah, it's 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 rewarding for sure. It's been fun to watch the local match. Um, 
the first one that Greg did, I went and a lot of the people that were there were not competitive shooters. They just plink at home and wanted to learn. And to watch some of those people that have come match after match after match, and now they're like winning and, you know, really Got. well and right. But, you know, at first it was just like, oh, I'm just coming. <clears throat> and they show up with like a stock gun, you know, that has like nothing on it. And then now they're all like buying all these, you know, chassis to put them in. And Yeah. And yeah, I have two guys. Like <laughs> I have, I have two guys who came and um, one of them shoots an inexpensive Savage. He's really good. Another guy has a 1022 that he rebarreled. But like, you know, it's not like they're, they're shooting voodoos, right? Like it's very kind of like base class stuff. And they got so into it, instead of upgrading their rifles, they went home and built all the barricades and bought the steel target pack. And like, it's pretty, like I said, it's rural where I am. So a lot of people have a hay field behind the house or something where they can set up. And so I have these guys who are like shooting the course of fire a week or two ahead of me setting it up for a match. And when you take it to that level and, and, and put the dollars in the barricade and the practice, like those are the guys who are like on my tail or beating me, you know? They do that um, too. And it's so funny, like, He'll be setting up the match that, that morning and I'll be walking around trying to help like make sure that we can see all the targets from prone and everything. And I'll be like doing something and they'll come over they're like, that's not how you do that. And I was like, well, I just read, they're like, no, trust me. I've read it. I've shot it a couple times this week at home. And I'm like, or they're like, I've been dry firing this all week. <laughs> yeah yeah i have two guys who like that's what i do like i'll set it up and i'm trying to do 40 things i set up five stages i'm taking registration money you know doing all the match directing things and then i'll have like the barricades off and like one of those two guys will be like no 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 that's got to go like this and because just like you said they shot it all week long you know um which is pretty awesome like it's just it's just a rad community you know like i can't say enough about the precision shooting community and the rimfire community and like the way they've embraced my book it's just been it's been freaking awesome to to witness yeah because it's like it's it's written by one of us which is what makes it awesome um and you know like what jen was saying it's hard to find other places to get information you know because when i do what that you can trust that you can trust yeah because every, everybody's saying something <laughs> saying something different but like this is actually information for you know, what, uh, um, what we do. So it's, it's awesome. So before we kind of go down the, uh, rabbit hole of talking about this book, I want you guys to hear the, the first paragraph of it that, you know, I kind of read this. I was like, okay, yeah, this is gonna be a badass book from some of the notes what they're talking about. First, first words of chapter one, Alice and Zane, Lay prone behind a rifle, eyeing five targets stretching out over the desert from 100 to 330 yards on a hot Sunday in Las Vegas. The temperature hung around 90, the 20 mile per hour desert wind gusted to 40. Her dad and fellow competitor, Frank Zane, gave her a wind call. Allison watched the breeze lie down. Uh oh. Sorry, I'm new to, new to Kindles. Um, <laughs> there we go. Allison watched the breeze lie down, shook off her dad's effort, then ran her handheld casual wind meter and ballistic problem solver. She set up the rifle and in fast succession sent 40, sent 1040 grain bullets of 22 LR downrange, jumping between the targets at 100 and 330 yards, plus a few distances in between. She connected on seven out of the 10 shots, besting her dad and everybody else on the NRL 22 championship that day. If you've shot with Allison, that is literally the most Allison thing ever. That's awesome. That's awesome, man. So, so that, um, that I wrote a story uh, three years ago now, probably for films for four field and stream on NRL 22. And it went, um, it went like kind of viral, I would say in the shooting community. I don't know if technically it did by like a web nerd standard, but it got shared a lot for field and stream. And it was one of their more popular stories of that time. And that introduction comes from that particular story in Field and Stream. And so um, 
like I talked to Allison and her dad a lot when I was just kind of putting my toes in these waters and this sort of, uh, I would say like introduction piece on what is NRL 22 to, in that case, the film stream audience, but to a more general audience. Um, they, it, it came together and that was kind of how I started it off. And that, that story uh, and that chapter gets into what, what I think, and I, 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 think, I think a lot of people agree with me, like is the revolution, right? So like the name of the book is Rimfire Revolution, but like that's a real thing that happened. And the, the revolution happened in my mind when four years ago, independent of each other, NRL 22 was spun up and basically told shooters of the world that you can shoot a precision match in a hundred yards with a 22 and have just as much fun as if you're shooting a PRS match at a thousand. And while that was spinning up, Voodoo Gunworks came along and said, a 22 can be as accurate as your center fire. And it can be a full size gun on a chassis, Remington 700 footprint, ACIS magazines. And so all of a sudden you had a very grown up or sophisticated rifle platform. Mm -hmm. And those two things happened like within months of each other. And it was literally a year later at SHOT Show, I was walking around and every major firearm company had a badass 22. And people were talking, we're, we're talking about long range rimfire ammo. And I had, I had someone come up to me that year and they were like, man, you must be happy. Like the only thing interesting at SHOT Show this year is rimfire, you know? And it was, it was an actual like revolution in, in my mind. And it's, uh, it's still going strong. You know, it's a, it's a community or a, or a cult. My wife thinks it's a cult, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's going. I still want a voodoo. Yeah. One they're day. sweet, sweet rifles. But there, there's the so many good ones. One. What's that? If I win the lottery, I'm going to get one. <laughs> yeah. Solid goals. But say, I remember that, that you're at Shot Show, like, Every, you're right. Everybody was doing 22 stuff. And people didn't have stuff. They were talking about stuff they might have. Um, it was really cool because I was right as I was kind of getting into it also. So that's that's what I did. Shop show was learn about all sorts of fancy 22 stuff and then go home and spend a bunch of money. Yeah. Funny yep. how the market goes. You know, one year it's like everybody's got ARs to release. Another mm. year everybody's got 22 it's the year of the 22 <laughs> yeah 100 percent. you know subcompact nine millimeters you know that was one that yep. definitely comes in waves um but everybody i know like making guns like i have a great relationship with mike and paul at voodoo or like dan at bagara and i mean they all they're telling me and they're telling everybody like they can't make them fast enough. I think the wait time on a Voodoo now is like five or six months. Like Bagara is selling every single 22 they make the second it comes out. Mm -hmm. So um, so I don't think it's a fad, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. The 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 trajectory is hasn't it hasn't tapered off, you know, which is exciting. You know, it feels like we're all kind of on the front end of something that could be major in five or ten years or more major. Well, I mean, the great thing about 22 is it's inexpensive. It's easy for kids um, to learn, you know, recoil is good. And it, the gun itself is a little bit lighter. So if you have a child, um, it's a little easier for them to do than center fire. Right. Yeah. Anyway. So it's just such a great way to get women and children involved. It can be a family event. Everybody can shoot the same gun, which is amazing because with a center fire barrel, you've got to let it cool down. So you don't want to be sharing with somebody because you'll burn your barrel out faster. And um, yeah. you don't have to worry about that with a 22. So it's like genius. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're like wine. They get better with age. The barrels tend to get better with age. <laughs> Ooh, wow. So what inspired you to write Rimfire Revolution? Was it just to help people out? And so I, um, I was kind of looking for my next sort of big project. Um, and I, I pulled together all the stuff that I had written, like that first field and stream story. 
and I had something like 60,000 words and, you know, a book of, of magazine stories that I wrote for primarily FS and Gun Digest. And so um, I pulled that together and I just thought, and I guess this was, yeah, it was, it was at that shot show. So it was in January. And I talked to my publisher at Gun Digest and I was like, what do you think? You know, and he kind of like was into it and whatnot. And then I sent him a couple samples. I sent him a story I wrote on tuning 1022s. And he loved that. And he was like, yeah, let's definitely like make the book happen. So it was really more like a, a happenstance thing, but it was funny, like the way the world worked, obviously COVID happened in March and all my freelance were all the magazines con contracted, like a lot of businesses just out of fear. And I've always been a freelancer. I'm not staff anywhere and haven't been for 10 plus years. Um, so I saw a lot of that work dry up. So all of a sudden I had more time and I just used that period. Like, like I said, like we live middle of nowhere, like the, the pandemic didn't really affect us in a big way. I mean, we were on lockdown and whatnot, but like I'm in a back building behind my house. Like I joke that that didn't change my life at all. Cause I walk a hundred yards through my backyard to work every day. Um, and I just had less magazine stuff to do. So I was like, I'm just, I'm just going to hammer down and work the phones and everybody was home and everyone was picking up. And this thing that I thought I had almost done with all this big word count, I mean, it just spiraled. Um, it took a, a full year of research and calling people and I was late getting it to my publisher. So um, it just seemed like a good idea kind of at the time. But then, you know, I guess to answer your question, like once I got it down the rabbit hole and was like in the research because you always learn more it's like opening a door when you decide to do a project like this like there's so much in that book I didn't know until I set out to write about it um and I just uh I just about midway through I was like I don't you know I don't want to sound like braggy but I just didn't think any, there's been a book like this in a while and I was like I'm gonna this is an opportunity I think to write something all in one place that like I hadn't seen, you know, and in my research project, I was reading books like from the 1920s up to every single rimfire or precision shooting book I could find on Amazon. And I just felt like I had an opportunity here to do something kind of, kind of different. That's both like broad, but also gets in there pretty deep. Um, so that, that fired me up kind of mid process, you know, so. Yeah. Is this the only book you've written or have you done other books? First book. Yep. Only one. Yep. Only one. Yeah. I've done a couple of like really long magazine features, you know, I've got a couple 10,000 word stories under my belt, but I've never set out to write a book. So this was the, the first one. Yeah. Props to you. Cause I just got my master's about two years ago and I had to write my capstone was like 52 pages long and I thought I was going to die. It was yeah. awful. Yeah. The worst thing ever. Maybe because I didn't really enjoy it, but it was I, to write like that all the time. Like, uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. I did. I did a master's too. I have a master's degree, and like my thesis was probably fifty thousand words. I, I'd have to look. Actually, I don't really know, but it was long as hell, and that was suffering because I. I mean, I did like it. I liked the topic, but I had a time crunch and a deadline, and like. This one, like, I don't want to say it wrote itself because it, well, I definitely suffered like coming up against my deadline and I was late, but when you're writing about something you love, or at least me, you know, you know what I mean? Like I was so saturated in that world and all I wanted to do was talk about guns and shoot. And so it, um, it, it felt like a job at times, but it was not nearly the, the trauma that, uh, that my master's thesis was. So coming in hot off of writing this book, are you going to write another one? You know, people keep asking me that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Like I'm thinking about what the next big project was. Um, I was talking to one of my, one of my magazine editors and he was really pushing me to do something on center fire, like write like a center fire equivalent of this. But I honestly don't feel like I shoot enough center fire. I mean, I shoot a lot, but I don't have a PRS network, you know, like I don't go to those matches regularly. Um, I mean, so I'm kind of thinking, change. what's that? I said that can always change. It can change. Yeah, 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 it can change. So 
I don't know. I don't, I don't, some, something's going to come next. I'm de- it's definitely not going to be my last book. I just haven't found the, the topic or project that I'm ready to, to commit a year of my life to again. <laughs> exactly. And I, I think writing about something that you're truly passionate about, you know, make, makes it a lot better. Yeah. hundred percent, you know, versus, Oh, I've got to find a project. I've got to write another book. I got a book that I got to release in, in a year. You know, what am I going to write it on? Like that, that would suck. But yeah. you know, the, the way you went about this and it was just, you know, what you're truly passionate about, you know, you, and you can tell it reading the book that, you know, you, you, you were knowledgeable to begin with, and then you kind of went and sucked every knowledge source you possibly could to get everything together. We have a uh, live comment from Rob. Rob said, fantastic book, Michael. He learned more in that book, more on that book and Rimfire than years of actual shooting. Well done. Awesome, man. Thanks, Rob. I- that's that's cool. I appreciate that. So, Greg, you got to read this book, right? I did. Can you did. give us your review? All right, we'll, we'll do the Greg review. First off, step number one, did you guys know that you could take your practice score tablets and download a thing on them that you could read a book on? There's this app for the Kindle called the Kindle app, and there's like an actual book on there, and it's so cool. That's Never knew you could do that with a practice score tablet. That's so 2008, and you are so 2008. I wish I knew who sung that song so I could ask you if you just quote them, but now the song's stuck in my head. Is that Fergie? Yes. Yes. Called it. Um, But anyway, um, it really is, um, like I've said, like 50 times so far. It's awesome reading something from somebody that's actually inside of our sport. Um, You know, like Jen was talking about earlier, when – you know, and pretty much everybody I know, unless you're lucky and have, you know, oh, my neighbor happens to, you know, be uh, place number 10 in the PRS and they want me to shoot. And, you know, there's my knowledge source right there. If you don't have a, a contact person, sometimes, you know, you go on, you know, a long range shooting page and you're like, hey, you know, I want to shoot PRS. What do I need? And someone will come and tell you, you need a 300 win mag. Um, someone else will tell you that, you know, yeah, do that, but it's unsafe to have a trigger that's, you know, under a pound and a half, you got to have a two, a solid two pound trigger on it. And someone else will say, no, for bench rest, you know, two, three ounces is all you want. So it's great to have actual focused knowledge on our, our sports and a, you know, a great reference for information versus, you know, unvetted sources online. Um, You know, definitely, you know, you can tell that you've, you've been in the sport talking about, you know, Allison and, you know, lots, Greg, Greg Hamilton and Sean Murphy and lots of other people that are competitive shooting in our, on our sports. It was cool hearing about that. Um, and we were talking about this before the show. Um, I consider myself fairly knowledgeable on rimfire shooting. Um, I've been doing it for about since the beginning of NRL 22. Um, and I'm always a nerd researching stuff and trying to figure stuff out, but I learned a ton of stuff from this book, but it's also written that somebody that's brand new could pick it up and know what the heck you're talking about. You're not going straight in and saying, you know, Oh yeah, I took my Kestrel, wrote my dope down, you know, took out my tripod and, you know, loaded six rounds into that MDT 12 rounder, you know, there, everything's defined well, so that it can be read. Um, but I do have one complaint. Oh, this is the most expensive book I've read recently. So you're not, you're not the first person who said that. You know? So, so check this out on, on here, on, on, on my little Kindle thing, there's a, where'd it go? Shop Amazon. So literally like, look, so there's the book and then you click there and shop Amazon book, Amazon. And like, there's boxes showing up at my house for new gun builds that I decided you talk a lot about 1022s. I've had one sitting around. So like got a new stock for a 1022 there's scopes and all sorts of stuff. And I haven't even bought the expensive stuff because I got some big expenses coming up this, uh, this month, but you know, all that talk about Elijah barrels, like there's probably going to be one on a 457 behind me at some point in time. And he texted me at work today and was like, yes, either yesterday or today, do you have any extra scope rings laying around? I need some scope rings now. No. Yeah, you know, you got scopes, scopes sitting around that got to go on something. Oh, no, I decided I've had, here we go. I got all sorts of fun stuff. I've had literally like the lamest little 1022 for like three years now. It's a used rental gun from Sharpshooters. 
I don't even know how these things work. But like, so this is used as a running gun. But look at that bolt. Like you, most people would pay a substantial sum of money to get a ten twenty two bolt that shiny. Totally. So, so it's it's super smooth, but like this little stock, like it's kind of crappy. So I think I'm going to start playing around with this ten twenty two. Definitely not going to replace that or the B fourteen over there. But I don't know. You start talking about ten twenty two, so now I'm building one. I'll uh, I'll show you one. I brought props. Um, yes, props. You have all the fun toys. This is um this is my ten twenty two, and uh, it the barreled action. And actually came, a buddy of mine got it on the Rimfire Central Forum. And it was put together by a Texas gunsmith, Joe Sharon. Um, you want to talk about spending money on 1022s, Google uh, the Auto Benchrest Association. And he's a benchrest shooter, gunsmith, but all they shoot is 1022s. And he put a shill in, I think it's the match select. It's whatever their highest level barrels on it. And it came in a in a bench rest stock and whatnot. Um, lights out. It is it is at fifty yards. It's one of it's it's arguably the most accurate barrel in my safe. Um, and then I dropped it in the new KRG Bravo uh, chassis uh, Atlas bipod. Like I mean, there's a there's a lot of good bipods out of here, but I'm definitely partial to these these atlases. Um, and it's got a kid trigger that I also got from a, a friend kind of wheeling and dealing. Um, and that's a, a one, a, it's a single stage, one pound kid trigger, which is like, you know, there are a lot of 1022 triggers. Um, there is only one kid trigger, you know, and you can argue about barrels and receivers and aftermarket this and aftermarket that, like in the trigger world for these guns, the kid is the kid stands alone. Um, and then it's all, I'm constantly playing musical scopes. This is kind of one of my go-to favorites. I don't even think they make it anymore. It's the Nikon Black. This is a six by 24, but it was a relatively inexpensive scope. Like when Nikon went out of the game, I ended up grabbing a couple of them because the price really dropped. Um, and for like a hundred yard 1022 match, man, it's a, uh, it's a tack driver. Um, but like, I love it. And like, I've, I've, I don't even know how many 1022s that I've built and worked on and usually I end up moving down the road to make cash for the next project, you know, mm -hmm. but this is kind of where I landed um, for like a PRS style 1022. I'm super happy with it. Um, I do have a different receiver and stock. I'm going to, I'm going to mess with the manners, I think next and send That's it to nice. Joe and have him, have him do it. Um, so yeah, the, the 10 22s are so much fun because you can do it all yourself, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. I love it. Let's say if I just had a lathe at the house, I could do a lot more myself, but yeah, I, I love stuff where I get to tinker. Yep. Good times. Good times. So I got a youngin coming in. Go ahead. A youngin. So, uh, Hugh asked, from a practical perspective, how well have kid or similar done relative to voodoo or similar? Um, that's a tough question, man, because they're such different platforms, you know? Like, I would say, like, if you think of, like, the, the hierarchy of, like, rifle building, so, like, a tier one rifle, you know, like a, a, a voodoo or a Rimex, you know, in the on the 700 platform, like those guys kind of have their own thing. Um, and they're their own thing, but like that to me is different than a 1022. A Remington 700 platform bolt action rifle and a 1022, it's like, it's like apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. So, but if you think about like the 1022, like what is a tier one rifle? Um, I think Kid is right up there. Volkortsen is definitely right up there. Um, and then very much like on the Rent on the Remington 700 side, like the 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 tier one one the the team six of these rifles, right? The CAG of these rifles are the customs, and then there are guys like Joe Sharon who are building like true like made to order rifles. Um, so like I think I think Kid has done has done great. You know they're they're lights out. Um, 
they they have been, and I think Volkortsen as well. I think you you would say I think they would say they haven't really pushed hard into like the tactical precision like sniper match kind of builds. Um, guys are set definitely using those rifles for it, but I don't know if they've come out of the gate like strong, like with a, or, or, or have tried to come out with like a long range 1022, you know, or like a fast twist barrel 1022. So it's a little different kind of world than like the Voodoo's and the Bagaras and the, and the Rimex where like those are, those are, those rifles are built for NRL, 22x like they are built to shoot little groups at 300 plus yards um that's what they're being designed for you know and i don't i don't know if you could say the same thing of any of the of the the 1022s but they can but i think the action can certainly do it and that's like why i like messing around with this one here it's like why i want to build another one you know is to see like with that blowback action which has much less control obviously than a bolt action uh, at ignition uh, can, like, can I build a 1022 that's shooting as tiny a group at 300 or 400 yards as a bolt gun, you know? And I haven't spent enough time doing that to say, like, one way or the other. I think a lot of people are saying, no, you can't do that. Um, but then I think there are guys like Joe Sharon, and people said, you know, no, you can't build accurate bench rest rifles, and he's setting the world on fire with his. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but um, kind of how I think about it. Yeah, and I'm going to kind of agree with you. Like, I I think that it's super awesome that, you know, the the kit actions and the Bocortson actions and stuff, that they're, you know, doing doing good in precision, you know, NRL 22 and stuff. But, like, that's not even what they're designed for. They just happen to be just good. You know, they're designed for steel challenge and yes. hunting and stuff like that. But then people are like, oh, you know what, I, I – I'm going to take my 1022 and shoot 400 yards. Yeah, yeah. And and this year um, with the time stages in NRL 22, um, I I could see it moving that way. You know, mm -hmm. I could see like the the culture sort of embracing 1022s or semi-autos because we're eventually going to get to a point where that time stage is a real um, factor. And I mean, I'm no I'm no Greg Hamilton or Sean Murphy. But I definitely can run that 1022 ac more accurately, faster than I can run a bolt gun accurately. Even like the 360 Voodoo that's right next to it, you know. Um, and you could argue that there's some guys who may be as fast on the bolt, but my my skill set isn't there for sure. I mean, there's Is some that it, you're never going to be as fast as a semi-auto. Yeah. Like, even yeah. if you're super fast on the bolt, you have to also not disturb the rifle and have to find, you know, get back on target. Yeah, semi-autos are definitely faster. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. definitely. A couple of the unsupported stages. I, I, I'm not a good shooter. I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, when it comes to stand and hold your rifle and shoot, like, ugh, I, I am useless. But, like, to be able to just sit there and, you know, poom, 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 instead of poom, yeah, yeah yeah there's been a couple times like i'm gonna go get the 1022 and shoot this with that <laughs> it's yeah. lighter it's totally but there but but there are guys who are lights out with a bolt gun and like probably faster with a bolt gun than i am with a 1022 you know um, so i yeah, I don't know. I don't. I, I. I don't know. I guess the the jury's out in my mind about how competitive the 1022 platform could ultimately be, but I could see it like in the right hands being um, extremely competitive. You know, I think the real the the you know it is it, it native. It's natively faster, right? To your point, Jennifer. I think 100. percent It's in, like a natively a faster platform. Um, I think the question is going to be like when you get to it, the ELR stuff, like whether the velocities hold and, you know, they waterline consistently at distance. Um, yeah. Like so. I, I, I could see them being highly competitive inside of a, you know, 100 yard NRL 22 match. Right. But, you know, if you're shooting a three and 400 yard match, like I'm, I, I think that that little bit of accuracy and a little bit of 
deviation that you get from the semi-auto is going to kind of play into it a little bit more. Yep. Yep. It's almost like the debate on caliber, like some of the like caliber and weight of your gun and center fire is the same thing. I mean, you can give up, you know, you can give up some of the weight and by give it up, I mean, make it heavier and heavier and heavier so you can control recoil, but at some point it gets counterproductive because then you're moving this 30 pound pole from one, one position to the next and it, it gets difficult and you can definitely tell people with lighter guns can move it faster, but then they have more recoil. So it's, I think it's gas gun versus bolt gun. It's kind of the same argument. Yeah. There's going to be some advantages, but at some point it becomes counterproductive and you have to decide where on that spectrum you fall for what you want out of the gun. 100%, 100% accurate for sure. But, so you got to um, work with Sean and Greg, my friends, um, Sean Murphy and Greg Hamilton and some other people, but who's like the coolest person that you got to work with? That's obviously us. He didn't work yeah. with us. To the right look. Oh, gotcha. Greg and Jennifer. No. See, that's right answer. Oh, I, I, that's a great question. Um, I actually work with so many cool people. Like in the back of the book, there's a Q and A section. It's called like with the thought leaders, and it's just sort of the unvarnished interviews or section of interviews. Um, and you know. Mike Bush from Voodoo, uh, he's kind of, he's become a buddy. He was up here shooting with me uh, a couple of weeks ago, huge supporter of, of the book and my work. And, you know, if anybody has done a lot for this space, like him back in the day, like retrofitting 40 X's to, to, to build center fire style 22s. Like, I mean, a lot of that work is why we're here. So, you know, I have oodles of respect for Mike um, and, and what he's done. Um, likewise, I spoke to an Olympian, uh, Ginny Thrasher, who won gold in Rio. And like talking to her was fascinating because that, that particular game the, uh, at 50 meters or 10 meters for air rifles, the guns are, are so sophisticated and the ammo is so good for that distance that like they don't even think about the gear. Like she's shooting the same rifle that she got like before she was in college, like at the Olympics, because the platforms are so dialed to that sport. And talking to her was turned into a discussion on stillness and breath and breaking the trigger and all like the, 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 the technical shooter stuff that you need to do to compete at that level. You know, so that was that was fascinating. Um, I spent a lot of time on the phone with Dave Emery, who was at Hornady, um, and now he's a kind of working into his retirement job at a at a, at a outside the the gun industry. Um, and he developed the 17 HMR and the 17 Mach II, and so like getting his ideas on like how he came up with it. Um, I talked to him a lot about 22 Magnum, which is like one of one of my favorite rounds and what makes those, why those had the reputation for inaccuracy, but why with modern chambers and modern bullets, they can be turned into absolute smoke shows. Um, so that was awesome. Talk with 22 Plinkster. I shot with him a couple of years ago on a field and stream project. Um, and I think he's just like a wicked ambassador for the sport, you know, like as far as just getting like randos on YouTube interested in shooting, I don't know if anybody's doing a better job than him. And so just talking to him and like how he's thinking about, you know, at, at the time we talked a lot about the ammo crisis and whatnot. Um, that was, that was fascinating. Um, I talked that was, to a, that was a really cool surprise when I, when I turned the page and was like, or excuse me, when I swiped on my Kindle because I'm high tech, and uh, it's like 22 Plinkster. No way. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 He's a, he's a, he's a great dude. Um, like I, I spent um, a lot of time talking with Dan house at Bagara. Um, and he has an incredible story. That's actually, we, I, I, my day job, I work for black rifle coffee and we have a website of a, a media site called coffee or die. And I actually syndicated um, or, produced the Lar the Bagara chapter on Coffee or Die. So if you guys are, people are watching this and they Google Bagara Coffee or Die, you'll see that section. Um, and Dan is an awesome guy. 
and he was a gunsmith at um, the at PWS, the Precision Weapons Section of the U.S. Marine Corps. So he was basically gunsmithing and building all the rifles for like scout snipers and recon snipers and the national match team. And he basically took that fastidious sort of, you know, again, he's like the SEAL Team 6 of gunsmiths, right? It's like how you should think of these guys in the military. And he took that process and brought it to Bagara to make a factory rifle. So like talking to him about like how they set up the machines and what he learned and like that was that was fascinating. Um, Steve Bolter, Boltar, I'm probably saying your name wrong. Sorry, Steve. Um, he was in for, for a time he was the president of Anschutz North America, then he was in charge of the custom shop. Um, he's like an old G in the game. Like he was a nationally competitive silhouette shooter, bench rest shooter. Um, awesome guy, super opinionated, like knows what works. Um, he's actually at, I think, Tech Soul now. Um, that happened just uh, recently, just as the book was getting to press. Um, but Steve B, as he's kind of known in the world, like, again, awesome guy. I would get on the phone with him and then like hang up three hours later. And it was just like he would download, you know, information. Um, so super valuable. Um, so yeah, you know, like, is there just one? Like, I, it, it, I, I was lucky. I got to, I got to really talk to the cream of the crop and, and doing this project. Um, and I'm grateful to them all. And I thank them all for, for letting me ask them stupid questions and taking notes. <laughs> so I love the idea of this book. And like, I mean, we've had even some people, some, some families show up where dad doesn't necessarily shoot competitively. He's pl plinked in his backyard for forever. Um, and he has like 12 year old daughter and he's like, I want her to do this. And, and they don't know where to go. So I love that your book, then he could pick that up and, you know, have kind of a how to guide because we've had a few people that have done that. Um, but how do you think, like, how are y'all marketing it to get it? It's great within our industry, but I would love to see this like on the Barnes and Nobles bookshelf. Now they yeah, are yeah, so, um, so still over, but no, it is, it is, um, like, like Gun Digest is a, a fairly small niche publisher, you know, um, but they have a great network behind them. So um, it's distributed through a book network called Ingram. Like if anyone has a bookstore who's watching, they probably have heard of them, but Ingram is going to get it on the Barnes and Noble shelves. So it'll get there. Um, Amazon made a pretty sizable first order and they're working through those so you can get it on Amazon um eventually i think it will get to the, all the shelves of the barnes and noble or at least that's what i'm told um you can get it on the gun digest uh store page which for a while was cheaper than amazon i haven't checked on that but you should definitely um check around so like as far as you know guns are guns are spicy to half the country you know it's like the sad reality but like as far as like a gun publisher and like a gun book like this is going to be as like widely distributed as they can get, you know? Um, That's good. I just would love to see it kind of out there to, to show that, you know, our sport is not, you know, we're not out there killing things or killing people or, you know, people hear that you shoot and they're like, Oh, I bet you're dangerous. I'm like, no, actually I'm probably safer than most, you know, uh, but to be able to show it as a sport, I think is great. Um, I'd love to see it very widespread to the. Yeah, and, and a lot of that kind of falls on us too, as being ambassadors of the sport. You know, I know that you at work is the same as me at work. You know, you'll randomly be sitting somewhere and someone will call up, hey, I, I heard you shoot a lot. And then an hour later, you're finally get, getting up and going to your next meeting. Um, and, you know, I've already recommended, you know, I was like halfway through the book and I got somebody else that's, uh, he's actually looking at doing some of the, not NRL 22 style, but some of the um, auto bench rest or NRA or so, something in between 50 and 200 yards shooting paper. Um, and I've already said like, yo, dude, you know, nothing about competitive shooting, read this book. Oh, awesome, man. Awesome. I appreciate that. And, and that was the thing, like, I think we sort of packaged it and 
promoted it as like the NRL 22 book. And um, I think that's accurate to a degree because that sort of is what facilitated the revolution that led to all the super precision rifles, you know, like then, so there's a chapter or a big section in the rifles chapter on each of the precision rifles. But like, I went out of my way to do research really, because I don't shoot all of them, but do research and line out all the different shooting sports. So there's like a section on silhouette, there's a section on sporter rifle, there's a section on, you know, three position, you know, and I tried to give a, a flavor of like, okay, so, you know, we started out explaining how ammunition worked. We started out saying, this is the different kinds of ammunition. We started talking about rifles and their different use cases. Then I went into optics and accessories because we all know you need more than just the bare rifle and ammo. And then it was like, okay, what do you do? And you get to the shooting. And that's when it turned into a, a content on how to practice, which is where Greg Hamilton was like the man. Like it is that chapter is literally like a regurgitation of my discussions with Greg. Cause like, I know, I think I know how to practice, but <laughs> I don't win the fucking sniper match every single year. <laughs> like that's <the laughs> what I want to talk about practice with. Um, and then it goes into other disciplines, right? So we get into bench rest and whatnot. And like, I try to give, um, like references, you know? So like, if you read through that whole book and got really into bench rest, like your next stop should be kilo shooting sports in Winter Park, Texas. Like if you read this book and you're like, I want to do bench rest shooting, you should call them, you should ask for Dan and you should pick his brain. And he's got starter CZ bench rest rifle kits on his website for not a lot of money, or he can build you up a stiller with a shilling, you know? And so I really kind of like went out of my way to not make it just NRL 22. So like if that, if someone's watching the Olympics, which I watched all the shooting, it was awesome. And they want to get that 12 year old into Olympic style shooting. Like I hope in the book, they get to that chapter and like they, they have enough understanding to ask the right questions and go to the right people. And there's tons of NCAA money in shooting FYI. So you should, all you shooters out there put, put your kids in it. Um, get a, get a free ride to college. <laughs> and so I, I really appreciated all of the other shooting sports being in there, because to be honest with you, I, I know I got a, a couple of friends that do stuff like that. And, you know, when people ask me about stuff like that, I just say, Oh yeah, the, the old man stuff with the bench and the paper. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, that's, uh, that's, that's about all I know, but I now know, see, I even rattled it off for the auto metrics association. <laughs> And uh, that's my buddy, Joe. Yeah. So it is, uh, you know, it was nice kind of like, oh, this is like four hours worth of Googling right here in like this half of this chapter. It's great. Yeah, that's I'm, I'm pumped, man. I like I thank you for going into that, because like, honestly, that was that became the motivation, like save people the the, you know, five months of weekend evenings on the forums, you know, mm -hmm. like just put it all in one place, you know, that was kind of what, what it all came down to. Um, so I'm, I'm cool that you picked that up. You know, that's not something we talked about. So that's rad that you arrived at that. I feel like. Yeah, it was, it was a great little, little summary. So side note, like I got my little fix it sticks kit here. That's awesome. And you know, I have a bunch of parts around. So y'all check out this stock. I built a 1022 in my lap during that last conversation there. Awesome. Still need to do, need to find some scope rings. I thought I had some and then trigger and barrel and all sorts of stuff. But this is like so much nicer than it was at the beginning of the show. Yeah, that's awesome. And you did that. You did it while you sitting here. Yeah, I literally did it during that, last, during that last little bit of conversation there. I was like, I can't sit around this. Um, Hugh has a question. He wants to know if you have any feedback on why Anschutz has kind of not seemingly embraced the Rimfire Revolution and the NRL 22 and. Um, okay, so uh, if I'm wrong, hopefully Anschutz will jump in and, and comment on this, but um, my read on it and from talking to people around it, um, I'm talking to Steve who's not there anymore. So like maybe he doesn't know is that guns 
mean a very different thing in Europe than they do in America. Right? Mm -hmm. And if Germany comes up with something tactical, something snipery, like there's a lot of restrictions and issues that they could run into in Europe where the, where the guns are made. So I think a lot of it is, is cultural, um, but not necessarily because like Anschutz is making a decision that they don't want to get into this more. They almost have are like culturally handcuffed, I think is probably a, a good way to sort of talk about it. You know, um, they have, uh, they have a rifle in the, a trainer in the XLR chassis that's on their go to the custom shop website, you can find it. So they are doing little things, but um, their focus is the hunting market. Like their focus is um, like a higher end shooter market. Um, and so like, as an example, you know, they came out with the 1761. It's their switch barrel rifle. Uh, I don't know if you can get a 10 round magazine for it right now. Um, it, it launched with just a five rounder. And so like, that's a, if you do anything NRL, you know, like a 10 rounder is like standard kit. It's, it's must have. Right. Mm -hmm. And so for them to release a rifle that doesn't have that, um, it just shows like where their, their mind is. And, and I think, I don't know this for sure. Like hopefully someone gets in the comments who knows more than me. Like I could just be talking out here. Um, but I imagine the American market is, is not like the focus, like they're designing guns for Europe. Um, and, and it's a, it's a shame, right? Because like where they focused, they, they've dominated, you know, there's one biathlon gun. Like when the winter Olympics comes out, um, they, everybody will be shooting in Anschutz. Maybe the Russians will be shooting in Izmith or something like it. You know, there's a, it's not the only one, but it's the only one that's won medals, you know, that Fortner action. So like they got deep into biathlon and they dominated. Um, three position, it's a little different. There's a lot more options out there. Um, and I think some would argue that they've gotten less competitive as the the bleakers and uh, fine work brows, I'm probably saying that wrong, um, have kind of become more and more um, prevalent in that game. Um, but yeah, I just, I just think it's a, I think it's just kind of like a European mindset. Like they look at America as like a bunch of kind of tactical kind of wannabe guys playing games on, on, on ranges, you know? Whereas they want Olympic medals or they want small game hunters or they want, you know, affluent shooters with like tricked out, beautiful walnut stocks, you know, um, it's just different. It's just a different, I think they just have a, a different mindset. And I think a lot of it is, uh, is cultural, you know. So we've had multiple people ask in the comments if there's any plans to make this an audio book. They don't have time to sit down and read. They want to listen to it. I think you should totally get like Jim Scouton with that booming voice to read the book. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, I've heard a lot of that and I got to bring that up. Yes. So like I'm all into it. I mean, yes, I want to see that happen as bad as you guys do. Um, it's just a matter of uh, time and economics, you know, so um, I do have to bring that up. I have a call with them later this week. So I do have to mention it because this is not the first time I've I've heard this. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm on it. I'm gonna do the best I can. So I, I love Jen's recommendation on who to read the book. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good voice. I, I still laugh at the first time meeting him in person, and like, that's not a TV voice. That's it. That is just his voice. Yeah. Legend. Yes, indeed. Like everybody knows that voice. Even if they don't know they even if they don't know they know that voice, they know that voice. Yep. So is um, there anything that you learned in writing this? Oh, I mean tons, tons, you know. <laughs> like I did not I went into this as like a reporter, not as a guy who thought he had all the answers. Um, you know. Gosh, there was so much I learned, you know, I, I'm kind of like a history nerd. So like, 
it really drove home like the the early history of firearms like the medieval history of firearms like i found um totally uh totally fascinating so like you know if you think about like the medieval days there were there were knights in armor with swords right like a medieval knight and that was a uh uh that required training right so like to be in the warrior culture in medieval europe like you need to know how to ride a horse you need to know how to sword fight like you had to basically do this time investment and in where if you were a nobleman you were like a professional warrior right and then they came out with long bows but they, they were so heavy and as everyone who does archery knows i shoot a lot of archery as well that's a skill so same thing you had to train up and then they came out with crossbows, which they were like, oh, well, crossbows, any joker can fire a crossbow. But they were hard to manufacture because of all the levers and the pulleys and the horsehair string. And like making a bow was a lot harder than even in the back, the old days, making a metal tube and putting gunpowder in it. So like the very first firearms, like when those started rolling out in Europe, all of a sudden you had like a, a, a low class, like peasant soldier had a tool that could knock a knight off his horse and maybe kill him. And so all of a sudden the training curve, like a guy didn't have to spend his whole life to be a professional soldier and like be deadly. And so that sort of like advent of firearms and that effect on world history, like it totally democratized it you didn't have to be a wealthy knight with like a great you know trainer or a coach to be deadly on the battlefield you know it was it, it was almost like today like i'm a big second amendment guy i work for a big second amendment company and like it's the first right you know and it it always was like since day one they realized like if we put firearms in these people's hands like they can take down the tyrants. And uh, I just, I guess I kind of thought I knew stuff about that history, but when you really get into the, 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 the deep story of like what firearms did, I mean, it's, um, it's powerful. Like, and it's no surprise, like right a couple a hundred years, 200 years after firearms get prevalent, we start having stuff like the French revolution and like these uprisings and like all of a sudden, the people like have a tool to uh, uh, stand up for themselves, you know, to fight back against their own tyrannical governments. Um, so like, I've always been a, a believer in like the second amendment, but like doing that history stuff, it was like just eyes wide open. Like this has always been the case that this has been a tool for the people. Um, so yeah, that, that, that fired me up and that surprised me. I didn't expect, I thought I was going to have to like write the history chapter, almost like you got to eat your vegetables, you know, I got to get through this because people need to know it. Um, but man, I got hooked on it. It's uh, the history of firearms and what they've done to just like human culture uh, is, is freaking fascinating and for me. Yeah. It's very, it's very interesting to look back and see some of those things. Uh, I still want to get to the Cody Firearms Museum because I think that would be absolutely cool. And uh, if you ever need a history buff for guns, Ashley Lebinsky, she is uh, a genius with all that stuff. She was oh, here over there. And she is, I love listening to her stories. You know, she'll be like, oh, yeah, there was this one time, this, the gun with this and that. And I'll just sit there and listen, you know. I'm not even a history buff, but it is cool to see like the evolution of guns and how it has, how they've, you know, impacted history all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. They've always equaled freedom. Always. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, that's, that's powerful. Um, I messaged Ashley on Instagram. I wanted to send her a book, see what she thought, but I never heard back from her. So if she's listening, like send me her address. <laughs> I, want, I want feedback. Same. Jen, shoot her a text. I know. I'll have to message her and be like, hey. Check, check, check your DMs. Someone's trying to slide into them. Yep, totally. <laughs> I might have something to say about that, but. <laughs> yeah. No, she, she is really awesome. Which like, I, I'm pretty sure we had her on the show, I'm going to say a month ago, but it's probably like three months ago. And I pretty much just sat here and like just kind of soaked it in. 
just the amount of the amount of knowledge that uh, she just kind of endlessly spewed. Um, so what are some of the big things for shooting sports as a whole, not just, you know, growing NRL 22 that you think this rimfire revolution has kind of helped with? Um, I guess like, as far as the revolution, um, I think it's like given more accurate rifles to, to shooters, you know, like, um, the public now really demands like sub MOA accuracy. I think like if a guy buys um, a rifle at any price point and puts good ammo with it and does the time to match the ammo up to the rifle and it's not shooting a half inch at 50 yards, um, they'll be disappointed, you know, they'll, they'll complain. And that was just not the case. Like these rifles weren't, 22s were thought of as kids rifles and toys and whatnot. Um, so I think it, uh, I think it, it, it basically, I think it's taken like the accuracy bar of all rifles and, and raised it a little bit. And a lot of that too, I think is already was kind of happening in center fire, like factory, even inexpensive rifles have gotten way accurate, like with the advent of like five access CNC machines and like modern production practices. And like in the last, God, probably like 20 years now, like a $300 rifle shoots lights out, you know, they're shooting as good or better than like the custom rifles of like the sixties and seventies, you know, and a lot of that too has to do with ammo. Like, like, you know, we, we lose sight of it because we're, or I do, because I'm always focused on the guns, but ammunition has never been better. Like at any time in human history, have we had ac as accurate and precise ammo factory ammo, um, in 22s or center fire, you know, let alone if you get reloading, you know? So um, I think the, the rimfire revolution has sort of brought all that or helped propel all that, um, I think within the rimfire world, you know, like guys are, and gals, shooters are, are demanding a kind of accuracy that like wasn't even talked about, you know? And even, and at like stupid long ranges, you know, like I have guys who, or, or no guys have friends who shoot 22s at, at ridiculous ranges. And that's stuff that was never thought possible. That was like scoffed at, like you were being silly or trying to do a parlor trick, you know, and guys are like getting like repeatable small groups at six and 700 yards with, with a, a like a brick, like a 40 grain, like lead brick, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. So, and I think a, another big thing is, you know, stuff like this, you know, when you got optics coming out, like the, the new Venom, yeah. it's like, why did I pay for that? Like 500 bucks yeah. for a, a full feature, high quality precision rifle scope. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, my, my, my razor on my, on my center fire is definitely nicer, but I mean, Shooting NRL 22, I'm not lacking anything using that scope. Yeah, 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 100, 100%. My, like, I always get asked in my local match, like, what optic do I want to get? Because if a guy comes from sil from Silhouette or Steel Challenge or something, they understand the rifles pretty quickly if they're a rifle person. But the scopes, I think, really freak people out who are new to this because they got all those hash marks and there are all these dials and everything. Um, and then you're supposed to turn the dials. Yeah, you're supposed to turn them. Exactly. I know. I know somebody at their at their first match was like terrified to turn the dials. Hey, I shot pretty good too for holding over the whole time. I know, which is the awesome part of it. I shot three gun before I did this, and in three gun, like you don't dial your scope, right? I mean, it's too fast, so you, it's not like you're going for speed. So just no one ever dialed their scope. So I go to this match and. I'm shooting like, you know, out to, I think we had something at 900 or maybe a thousand. And uh, I'm just holding over the whole time because I'm scared to dial because I'm scared I'll get off and not get back to zero. I don't know why I was so scared because now I'm like all the time, but I did. And that on the tower, I'll never forget Al Olivier. It's like, 
uh, I need you to dial your scope back down to zero. And I was like, it's on zero. He's like, no, I need you to dial it back down. I'm like, it's dialed down. And he's like, and I had just gotten like an eight on it. It was the best stage. Now I bombed some stages that day too, but <laughs> good on that one. It was a true flying out and from the prone. I had done well. And he's like, no, you need to dial it down. You just shot it like a thousand yards. So you dial it down. I'm like, I didn't dial it the whole time. And he's like, what? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm not dialing this match because I don't know how. And he was like, okay, we're going to get together and you're going to learn how to dial scope. <laughs> so I got together with Phil Cashin and Mary and Al Olivier and went and shot with them and, and like dialed to this and I dialed and I held the crosshair and pulled the trigger and I was like, oh, that's like cheating. <laughs> <laughs> Kentucky windage no more. I didn't know any better. I didn't have anybody teach me. See, I didn't have a rimfire re uh, revolution book. But, but so, so the thing about scopes, right? Like your point that they've gotten less expensive and like you have to dial and all of that. Like, that's one of the things that I get asked about more than anything. People come in here and like these inexpensive scopes, like my go-to recommendation is that Vortec Diamondback Tactical, you know, it's, it's just a, it just works, you know, and it's repeatable and, um, you know, you can get that on sale for what, like, 400 bucks, 350 bucks, something like that. I say, I think it's three, 350 on, on sale. 300 on sale, you know, yeah. and like more than enough to, for a hundred yard match, you know, and with a 22 at a hundred yards, like you're putting, you're, you're putting dope in the, in the, you're, you're spinning the turrets, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I'm saying it's nice, everything inside of a hundred yards. So, you, cause you're pretty much like zero to two. Yeah. Yep. maybe 2.2 instead of you know it, it's different when you get out and shooting mineral 22x you know we were dialing in I, I don't even remember how much i have to spin in that thing but spin it all the way and then hold over and yeah. just you know five minutes cranking it back down but for shooting inside of 100 yards it's pretty easy you don't have to worry about getting a rev off or anything like that yep yep yeah i was shooting at 500 a couple of weeks ago and um I think it was 23 mils is what I landed on, you know? And so like, that's a lot. That's a, that's a big scope. And um, that's another thing. Like I love about this room fire stuff. Like you are really going to test the limits of your scope when you're, you know, got it at a 60 MOA can't and you're just cranking it and cranking it and cranking it. You know, I need, I don't even know, 1600, 1800 yards with my six millimeter Creedmoor to, to, to torture the scope frankly that much you know mm -hmm. but 500 yards 400 yards like you can really wear them out and and see if they're doing their job um you know so that's just like i was talking about this with someone else like we're talking about bipods and like again like rimfire uh uh it like tests the system because it's so unforgiving you know it's such an unforgiving platform like you will know if that bipod is solid or shaky or whatnot um even without the rim the the recoil because if you're canting a little bit or you're off a little bit or whatnot the 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 correction that puts on the shot when you're shooting long is so extreme um it's a great place to like demo in my mind center fire gear Yep, I agree, and I, I try and use as much similar stuff in between center fire and rim fire. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I got the the awesome lime green PDC chassis on both the center fire and the rim fire, and I, I don't have two razors. I'm, I don't have that much money, but, you know, tr try and keep everything else as similar as possible. I got the same bipods on both of them, um, so it helps kind of ingrain the, the gear and how it works. In, in how do you like that chassis? I love it. Yeah. It uh, literally to get the, you know, you unscrew your action screws and to get it out, you got to whack it because the way he has the inside of the machine, it just locks it down like dead solid inside of there. Um, it's got the, the Anschutz and the, uh, the Arca rail on it. At least on my rim fire, my, my center fire is a prototype of the Gen 5, so it doesn't have the arc on it yet. So I got an arc rail screwed onto the bottom of it. Um, and it just fits me. Um, I had a, a different chassis when I was first getting into it. And no matter what I could do, I couldn't get it to fit me. 
and I got behind a PDC and, you know, adjust this, move this shim, move this here. And it just fits me. Good. Yeah. That's awesome. They're on my list. I gotta, I gotta get my hands on one of those and play around with it. Um, I feel like I've seen a lot of them just in the last like three, four months. They, they're, they're coming out everywhere. Yeah. And they, uh, they were on a pause for a little while where he couldn't get, um, what was it he couldn't get? The, uh, the, the, the cushy buttons. He couldn't get a cushy buttons anywhere. So he had like a big pile of chassis and it's like, I'm literally just waiting on a butt pad for you guys. So they've been, they've been showing up more and more places and, you know, they show up around me because I let people shoot it and feel it and molest it and, you know, Oh my, you know, my daughter's thinking about getting one while here, you know, let's adjust this, see how it fits behind her. And, but it's, it's a great chassis. I do, I do love it. Awesome. Awesome. So what do you see for the future of Runfire? I know we've talked about where we've grown, but you know, what do you think we're going to grow on when it comes to guns or ammo or different types of competitions? Yeah, I, um, I think the distances are going to get longer. You know, I think NRL, 22x and prs rim fire is just going to get bigger um i think the 100 yard match games are going to are going to live on but the a lot i think the energy is going to go to longer and longer courses of fire um i think uh as far as the technology goes we're going to um see fast twist barrels become a real thing um i actually have a one in nine on this this voodoo right here um and it is as accurate as my most accurate rifles at, at 50 yards, it's right up there with them. Um, but then when you stretch it out to a hundred, 200, um, it stays tight. So, um, it's, it's really impressive. Like with just, you know, center X, like 40, 40 grain ammunition. Um, so I think we'll see a lot of that. I think a lot of these kind of boutique rifle companies are going to start offering fast twist as an option for that NRL 22X kind of long distance uh, guy. I think that's that's definitely coming. And then the, the other thing, um, and I'm working with a friend of mine on writing this up who's doing it, is reloading rimfire ammunition. The, the copper solid, the, the, the copper solids like the cutting edge in the Badlands or like that cutting edge kit is very nice. Um, it comes with primed brass, uh, and they have, I think it's like 32, 40, and 50 grainers. Um, that's going to change the game. You know, like uh, the BC is just so much higher on those bullets. So I think a combination of um, fast twist barrels for reload, hand loading rim fires, um, that's going to be, that's going to be the the game. Um, I mean, my, my buddy, AJ, who's a big, I think he's, he helped start the Rimfire tactical group on Facebook. Like AJ shot, um, shot regular 22s out of one in 16 at 1200 yards, which you mm -hmm. see that a lot of people think it's like a parlor trick or ridiculous, but he had a big six foot piece of steel and did it repeatedly. And he's, he's playing now with, I think it's a one in six shooting the 50 grain reload uh, uh, cop cutting edge kits. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't want to steal his thunder and talk about how far he's shooting out, but like he's shooting like three inch groups at 300 yards, you know, like legit center fire accuracy, like stupid accurate. Um, I think that's right. Three inches. He posted the photo and all that in the group. So we can fact check that, but stupid, tiny, three inch groups um so he actually just sent me a guide on how to reload it he described it as doing open heart surgery on a fire ant so um it's uh <laughs> yeah so like you got to be really into it to, to want to do this um but he's he's been a he's been a great resource and for the book he's in the book i wrote a story about him in gun digest uh before i got into the book um, but he just sent me his like man, like manual on how he's reloading this ammunition successfully. And, um, it's in my email and this week I'm going to go through it and kind of clean it up and ask him questions and whatnot. And we're going to put our heads together and find a place to publish that, to really just, just publish it online. Um, you know, free to 
anybody who wants to do this stuff. Uh, Cause I do think like that is, that is the bleeding edge, you know, and it's very niche, like an average NRL 22 or even NRL 22 X shooter probably doesn't want to get into this, but like the peak, like gun dorks, like, myself and like aj i think yeah exactly like you're gonna get you're gonna be into this man when you start seeing what they're doing and i feel like this article is gonna be just as expensive as your book yeah yeah i'm way more read it add to cart add cart add cart i've only spent 60 dollars over the course of the show though just fyi man yeah you get in you get into these super premium fast twist barrels and it gets and then a gunsmith to put it on uh gets stupid expensive but but you know like when i first talked to paul parrot who founded voodoo with mike for that field and stream article that allison is in i kind of ran at him pretty hard and was like i honestly i think it's kind of ridiculous that people are paying three or four grand for a 22 rifle and he put it this way and i i I love it and i believe it and it's still i think the best explainer he said like what else can you get into for five or six grand and be on the absolute bleeding edge? You know, Mm -hmm. I'll bet there's less than 25 guys in the country right now, like seriously reloading this stuff and shooting it at distance. If you want to, if you're like into motorcycles or Harleys or boats and you want to be on the bleeding edge of like a fast boat, like you're in it for half a million dollars. You know, if you want to track motorcycle, like easy hundred grand, right? But like, here's a thing where like a regular guy like me, who's a broke ass writer, can come up with five or six grand and be right up there on like the NASA space station level of rimfire ballistics. And that to me is fucking exciting, you know? Um, And I think it, it, it justifies in a way, at least for me, um, like going, going all in on this stuff, or at least that's what I tell my wife. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and I mean, they're they're not. I don't want to say, oh, voodoo is not that expensive, but you know, I'm I'm literally half Jewish, um, and so I always try and do stuff kind of on the cheap. So you know, I bought this cheap six hundred dollar CZ 457, and it shot like bone stock, slapped a scope on it. It was great. Now, like I can I could buy a voodoo for that. Yeah, because you know the same thing here. Of, ooh, add to car. Ooh, add to car. Ooh, add to car. Yeah. 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 I think that's, that's one of the other things I get asked a lot about. Um, I talk about this on the Rimfire Tactical podcast, but guys are constantly wondering, do you not buy a rifle and save your pennies so you can buy like a tier one rifle or do you get a 1022 or a CZ that you can shoot today and then slowly put the money into it and get the chassis and get the the what have you um you know that's a that's a tough question you know i'm like an immediate gratification person so i tend to just get whatever i can so i can get right in the thing and start shooting um but i definitely have a couple cz's that could have been could have been a voodoo or could have been a bagara and an mpa or uh could have been a rimex um but I don't, I, I, I worked on those CZs myself and got so much out of it and that stuff went into the book. So I try not to beat myself up for that, but um, it's like, it's a real debate, you know, like how do you, where do you put your dollars, you know? Yep. And like, I'm, oh, I'm more than happy with the rifle that I have. That, that rifle has never missed a shot. Now, now I, I have, but the, the rifle has never missed a shot. Yeah. You know, I've never, I've never once pulled the trigger and say, what the hell just happened? I pulled the trigger and say, I, I pulled when the X was down here, not when it was up here, or, you know, I, I coughed or I pulled the trigger sideways or something, but yeah. not once have I pulled the trigger and said, what the hell just happened? Yeah. 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 I mean, those, those Lijas barrels for the CZ are stupid accurate. You know, I have a proof barrel that shoots awesome. Um, so you know, the, the, 
it's, it's hard it, when you compare accuracy, like rifle to rifle or brand to brand, you can't really do it because it's always a relationship between the barrel, the build and the ammunition. Mm -hmm. So to say like this brand is inherently, this factory rifle is inherently more accurate than this other factory rifle. It's kind of bullshit, you know? And it's like one of those things about why, like there's not a lot of targets in the book because those targets only speak to my particular use case with me behind the trigger. Um, so I say that to say like their guys could get like a CZ, like bear rifle, like a $300 scout and end up with the action and decide I'm going to go for broke and make this the damnedest shooting CZ in the world. And, uh, it would be every bit as accurate. It could be every bit as accurate as any, anything out there. You know, there's a guy on sniper's hide, um, uh, uh, DJ Dylan, I think was his name. Um, he's, he's in the book who was making like interest accurate CZs, you know, Joe Sharon down in Texas. Um, I haven't talked to him in some time, but he was thinking about getting in and making bench rest accurate CZs. So, um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's kind of a tangent, but you can definitely get them. You can definitely get them there. And I think you can get 1022s there too, but I don't quite know about uh, distance like we talked about um, later, but I hope to find out. That's my next project. I'll say, I'm, I'm going to do some tinkering with that. But yeah, that's that's valid what, what you said about, you know, Rimfire's being so particular to, you know, this brand or this lot of ammo and stuff like that. You know, I've had my CZ for two, two and a half years now. And then I just picked up this B14R. I actually want, they donated it to an NRL 22X match and I want it. Awesome. And people, yeah, let's say it's a sweet freaking gun here. But um, yeah, everyone's like, oh, which, which is more accurate? I'm like, I, I can't tell you. Like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, when I bought that, the world was a normal place. And I went online and I bought like nine or 10 different brands of ammo. And I went and spent an entire day at the range shooting group after group after group after group. I found the ammo that it shot best with and I ordered a bunch of it. This, I had three different kinds of ammo that weren't, you know, bulk stuff. And I took those three ammos to the range and the group of those that shot best with is what it uses. So at some point in time, I'm probably just going to send it up to Ohio and let the guys at the test center figure it out, but not quite yet. Yeah, that's what I did. I mean, you, you saw it in the book. I went to um, Ohio to Lapua and brought, um, I think, seven guns. But we had an issue with the, the vice on the Bagara, so I wasn't able to shoot that one. But, um, you know, I did just that. I lot tested a bunch of them and, and showed the data and showed what I got with the heavy caveat that it's specific to the rifle and that ammunition. Mm -hmm. um, but that's definitely... The, the way to go about it, I think, is like if you're serious about this, like have budget set aside for ammo. And if you can't test it yourself, which most of us can't now, like you said, because there's just not the ammo's not out there, then send it to Ohio or Arizona to the Lapua Test Center. Or if you're if you want to go Ely, like send it to Texas, to Winter Park, Texas, and have them them do it. Um, the other thing too, like talking about like what rifle do I get? Um, if you're, if you want, if your end game is to get into like the 700 platform rifles, like a, a, a tier one Bagara or a tier one Rimex um, or tier one Voodoo, excuse me, or a tier one Rimex. Um, and you want to make that like, you want a custom 22, but you just can't afford it yet. That Bagara is like a hundred percent where I'm at. That's where I think there's a clear case of like getting a Bagara over a CZ or a 1022 because of the, the swappability of that platform. So you're getting a less expensive, you know, for about a thousand bucks, you can get that rifle and you have the barreled action. You're going to have to put a scope on it. You know, if you want to, if you want to just get the barreled action, I think you can get it for around $600 and then you can get that, JP chassis that you want or that Graybo stock and you can wait and get a Timony or get any trigger and then eventually get the trigger tech, you know? So yeah, exactly. Exactly. You can play those games and still be shooting with 
the Bagara. And then if you want to get a Voodoo or a Rimex, or you can just swap out your Bagara barrel action, sell that Joker on Sniper's Hide or wherever, you know, any of the classifieds, and then get the barreled action that you then drop into the system that you built around the Bagara. Um, I know there's a guy around me, um, local shooter, who just was doing that route because he's like, man, like, I'd want a voodoo, but I don't want to, I don't want to wait for it. And I don't have like four grand I can just drop on the table, you know, but he can get a, he can get a thousand dollar Bagara, shoot the shit out of it, love it, and then slowly go about upgrading it. And then if, if it turns out that he wants a better barrel, barreled action, he has all the stuff and can just swap it in. Um, so I think that's a great upgrade path for people who kind of want to get to the tier one stuff, but haven't, um, just don't, don't want to commit that kind of cash right away. Yeah. Mike Bell said that's exactly why he bought the B14R. Awesome. Awesome, dude. It's a great rifle. I have one. I have one here. I have the carbon barrel one. I, I love it. That, that carbon barrel is pretty lit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's accurate. So I, I see like a giant pile of rifles behind you. If like, all of a sudden, all but whichever one you were holding was going to disappear, which one would be the one that you would, what, what would be your favorite? The one that you would want to be your 22 for the rest of your life? Oh man, they're so, they're so different. Um, this, <laughs> this one's, um, I guess, like sentimental because the chassis was on the book. Oh. Um, this is, I should have a chamber flag in that. But this is a, a Voodoo 360 in a JP chassis. Um, and my buddy Nick at Freedom Sporting Goods in Waverly, South Waverly, Pennsylvania. Nick's an awesome dude and like honestly like one of the best Cerakote guys in the country. And he doesn't advertise and he's shitty on Instagram. And I always tell him like, dude, you got to get your work out there. Um, but he just did this for some videos that we're putting together, did this paint job. But this to me right now is kind of probably my most exciting rifle because it has the the one in nine twist barrel and it's that um that 360 action and like it just it runs like butter um this really to me feels like like the bleeding edge um i got the the pick rail up there i'm going to try to figure out how to get a prism on there i'm not quite certain it'll work yet but if it doesn't i'm going to go with the optic mounted prism um like literally two days after having it i was hitting it 500 yards with this so like as far as like the extreme long range stuff um this voodoo is uh is pretty special um it's got the big atlas super cal bipod on it you know like it's i i need to weigh it i always mean to and never do but it probably weighs 20 maybe even 25 pounds um it's like designed for ERL. Um, so this is the gun I'm probably thinking about the most. Um, you know, that that's pretty, pretty good one. This um, is my squirrel rifle. This one is probably the most sentimental. It's an Anschutz. Uh, it's in 17 Mach 2. Um, it's, a, it's a 1502, so it's a, it's a 64 action. Um, and I got started in this squirrel hunting. Um, I was writing a story for a buddy down in Kentucky, um, Will Brantley, hunting editor, Field and Stream. Awesome dude. Um, and he put me in touch with a guy who was disabled and would snipe squirrels, tree squirrels at 100 yards, drive in a quad in the dark and sit under a tree and let the sun come up and they'd come out. And I was talking to him and he said, um, he was talking about the scope he had on it. And he had, I think it was like a six by 20 loophole, like the EFR with the adjustable front. And I asked him why he had that much power. And he was like, I like to count their eyelashes. And I was like, <laughs> and it just blew my mind. I was like <laughs> at a hundred yards and it was in 17 Mach two. And he told me about this caliber and like, I had only been a plinker until then. And so I got on Gunbroker and I found the rifle he had, which I'm glad I did because you can't find them hardly anywhere anymore. And it was this Anschutz in 17 Mach 2. Um, 
and I set it up. It had a different, this has a, this is a Maven optic on it. Um, that's a two and a half to 15. Um, and it just like, in my mind, it matches the rifle, like maybe mm -hmm. a big, but it's a perfect, uh, power range for small game hunting. But like, I took this thing out and I didn't know anything. Um, and I set up a target at 25 yards cause I was going to zero it at 25 yards. And I shot the first one. It was low, but the windage was good. So I clicked it up and shot and it was a bullseye. And then I shot again and then no cut in the paper. I was like, huh? And I'm like knocking on the scope and I'm thinking the rings are loose. And I shot again and like nothing and shot again. And I was like, I'm missing the paper at 25 yards. And when I walked up on it, I realized they were all in the same hole, like literally the same hole at 25 yards. Like I could take, I got one right here. Um, like that's a Mach 2. So it's a 22 long rifle neck down to 17. I could take this live round and put it through the target and it would have held by the paper. The hole was so small, like the rim of the cartridge would hold it. And so after talking to this guy about squirrel eyelashes and then doing that at 25 yards, like again, like mind blown in like how accurate these things could be. Um, and then I got it all set up and where I'm sitting now, there's a window and you can see my house up there and there's a wood pile and there's a chipmunk on there. And I kind of had like rough phone ballistics on like what it would shoot. And I snuck out the door and got up and, and 78 yards cut that thing in half. And I was like, holy mackerel, like this is, <laughs> this is a tool. Um, so like, this is the gun, um, I've taken south a bunch to squirrel hunt and like real, uh, yeah, yeah, I just, I love it, you know? Like this one's a real like heirloom rifle, like the ELR one is gonna be. Um, and then, I mean, I got so many of them here. A Rimex, I got the Savage, I think it's a great inexpensive solution. This is kind of my modern squirrel gun. It's a Volkortsen Summit, it's also in 17 Mark II. Um, I love this thing. The summit is basically like a, you can see that action. It, it's a straight pull. So this is a 1022 footprint. You see, it takes a 1022 barrel, um, but it runs like a biathlon gun. So you can pull it back and get on it. Let's make sure we're safe here. Yep. And then pull it and then, so it, you're not doing the up and down motion of a turn bolt. And this thing is, has become my squirrel gun of choice because it's, it's stupid accurate and it's in that Magpul stock and it's like impervious to weather, right? So like in a, in a rainy day, you have that synthetic stock, the carbon barrel, um, it's super quiet. Uh, my buddy down there has a suppressor and I hunted with him and put it on there. It takes all the sharpness out of that 17 round. Um, so this one, I probably carry this small squirrel hunting or small game hunting or more than anything now. It's so light, it's so handy. Um, it's kind of become my go-to uh, small game rifle. You don't see a lot of these in like NRL 22, but I think that's a mistake. I think it's a very interesting action. I was about to say, I kind of forgot about the summit until reading the book. And then I was looking at those and I was looking at 17 Mach 2. Um, I did have a live question. Um, when we had the 360 up, um, talking about the, the fast twist rate, Wade wants to know if the max is still about 20 inches as far as wet length barrel. He also wants to know what length barrel that is, but he was asking if 20 inches is kind of going to be your max for a fast twist rate or if you vary that. Uh, 22 inches. Um, yeah, 22 inches. And um, that comes directly from Mike Bush, who's kind of probably tested this um, more than anything. Um, for whatever reason, like nobody fully understands it. Um, and Mike and I talked about this on a podcast, so I don't think I'm really giving anything away. Um, for whatever reason, when in these fast twist barrels, you need more length. Um, and 
maybe it just needs a few more inches to fully stabilize that bullet. That's probably it, but nobody like fully understands it. Um, there's also some thought that the longer barrel with the higher twist helps like stabilize velocity as well. Um, so yeah, yeah, 20, 22 inches, but like Voodoo's, I think, I think they're offering it. If they're not, they will. Um, if you order one of these from them, like they will talk you through all of that. Um, you know, 22 is kind of what you want. Um, or, or maybe longer, you know, and that's with a one in nine. And like, just for his assay, the, the one in nine is proving to be kind of the, 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 the long, the, the one in nine is proving to be kind of the twist of choice. And this is all like bleed, like happening within the months of recently. The one in nine is proving to be like choice for shooting like 40 grain, like standard ammunition, like center X or Ely or whatever your normal factory long rifle. Um, there is some thought that like the higher, like slightly higher, like one in 12 might be more accurate at 50 yards and, but not hold together as strong at distance. This is all like really bleeding edge stuff. So like maybe this will change, but this is kind of where a lot of the thinking is right now. And then for the heavy copper solids, like if you want to, if you're building a rifle for like the cutting edge system, um, the guys I know who are most successful at that are running a one in six. Um, and all the barrels to my knowledge are 22 inches. Um, if AJ's out there and you're watching this, you, he's, you, he lives on Facebook and he's a real expert. Um, comment on this, what your, what your barrel length and twist is for these guys. But 22, I think is, is the current magic number and that may get longer. You know, we don't, we don't really know. Crazy. Yeah. The and 22s are just amazing to me. Yeah, it can be everything to anybody, right? Like you can get like a $150 cricket and you can teach a kid how to shoot or you can get a pistol and do action shooting or you can get like a squirrel rifle or you can get like a bleeding edge voodoo and shoot that joker at 800 yards you know um, i love it it's like the most democratic of uh of rounds you know it can be anything to anybody uh it's a lot of fun a lot of fun and you could fit so much ammo in one ammo can yes i was i was looking through and organizing stuff a little bit yesterday and like i just have a little plastic 22 or 22 like this is my this is my 22 ammo not all this is what i bring the matches with me and then i looked i can't pick it up but you know the big giant ammo boxes that they sell at cabela's the big plastic ones like that's what i bring to a center fire match that's like it's a lot of work to carry so it, it is nice that like that has ammo for the both rifles um one of the matches i shoot sometimes has a pistol stage in there so there's like some Winchester white box for the pistol and it's just all in there, ready to go. Yeah, I like, I'm building a couple center fire rifles with some buddies who have lays and are like hobbyist gunsmiths and whatnot. Um, and I'm messing with a 300 short mag and I couldn't find ammo for it. And I was just in Utah at Black Rifle Coffee headquarters for a week. And so every time I had downtime, I was doing laps to gun stores looking for ammo. And I finally found 300 WSM, uh, and it was a box of Federal Fusion, good ammo, but not match ammo, like deer ammo, right? But but Federal's great stuff. 20 rounds for $57. And I bought two boxes and I was super happy. I was super happy I found it, you know? And I spent over $100 and- That's a thousand CCIs. What's that? So that's a thousand CCI standard velocities. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like Back that. in the day, you could get for that about that same money. Like, what would that be? Like one, one fourteen, one fifteen for about that same money, you could get a brick of Center X. Yep. Five hundred rounds of like super good uh, match ammo that'll like win an NRL twenty two national match. You know. So. So hey, I have one last quick question. Um, we're starting to run out of time. Did 
is the ISIS button real? Is that really, do they really have an ISIS button at Black Rifle headquarters? Or is that just <laughs> I didn't, I didn't see the ISIS button, but I'm sure it's real. There's a, there's a lot uh, uh, that, uh, that they have out there. That's, that's tons of fun. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, like, that's another thing about like what I do and where I work. Like, I'm really lucky that I have the job I do and for the company I do, because it's just fully supported, you know, like the guys I work with all bought the book and they're all shooters and second amendment big time. And I was out there, I did an arch, we did, we sponsored total archery challenge and I was just out there shooting archery, which is another thing I, I love and nerd out on, um, and it's just such a wicked culture. Like that headquarters at Salt Lake has a gym and an archery range. And there's a staff bow tech, bow technician. It's the company so into archery. So like you can bring your stuff and they'll make arrows and tune your bow. And it's just like, I feel lucky that I get to, uh, I get to hang out with these guys. But, but I wasn't in the military. So that's probably why they haven't shown me the fucking ISIS button. You know? <laughs> oh, that's, that's fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> that is funny. Greg, are there any more laughs? Uh, yes, Mike Bell said, book question, where's the best place to get it? Mike, you tuned in late, didn't you, boy? He did, but I figured we had other people that are slacking as much as Mike, and we could, it'd be a good, like, closing remark of, like, yeah, we talked about this book, the best place to buy it is. Yeah, any anywhere books are sold. I think the fastest way to get it is on Amazon, because um, it's on Prime, and you can get it in a day or two. Um, last time I checked gun digest store, it was the least expensive. If you want the hard copy, I also have a stack of them here. So if you message me, I'll sign it for you and mail it out to you. And it's just cover price, 35 bucks. So if anybody who made it this far, like all four of you, um, and want a signed book, uh, just message me on Facebook. I'm easy to find and we'll make it happen. Um, yeah, so you, you have options. Anywhere. And you could get it for a Kindle if you know how one of these fancy things works. Yeah, that's true. You could read it tonight on Kindle. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's true. All right. Well, I think it's about time to wind down the shout outs. Greg, you normally start us. I do. All right. So we're going to start off with GSO suppressors. They are a super awesome thing that you definitely need for your 22 because let's be real, the most fun thing ever to shoot suppress besides for like machine guns is, is going to be a 22. Um, shooters and sharpshooters of Augusta, where, where this project rifle that looks a lot better than the beginning of the show actually came from. Um, PDC Custom, the most beautiful rifle chassis known as man. You know, you got them in rim fire or center fire. You got lime green, you got normal human colors. They even make them for 10 22s. Um, Shooter's World Powder, um, you can still find it. Um, works great, single digit SDs, awesome stuff all the time. Hunter's HD Gold, um, I am blind as a bat and that kind of helps. It really does like increase the contrast of everything you're looking at. So if you haven't checked them out, check them out. Fix It Sticks, um, great for while you're doing a podcast or a vlogcast or whatever we actually call this and you decide to build a rifle in your lap. Um, if you happen to have one of those sitting on your desk, you can build a gun. And uh, Bortech, because this time tomorrow night, I'm actually going to be cleaning this thing to make it accurate again, because I've got to that point. <laughs> Mike, you got any shout outs? No, uh, no I don't. Um, I you caught me flat footed, you know, I shout out to everyone who bought the book. Like, thank you, you know, for, for supporting it and being into it. And um you know, I'm like, I'm an accuracy nerd. If I read, if you read something and you're like, no, it's the headspace is 42 thou. It's not 43 thou or whatever. Um, send me a message, you know, cause like, I think the book's doing well. I think we're gonna have multiple additions to it and I want it. Um, I want it as dialed as possible. So yeah, I hope, uh, I hope everybody loves it. And thank you guys for having me. And thank you guys who are out there reading the book and are, are into it and just keep shooting, man. Keep shooting. That's right. Everybody keep shooting. Well, I just want to shout out to you for spending what over two hours of your night with us talking about all this and kind of getting the word out and shout out to writing a book. That's going to be, I think a really good 
tool for anybody that wants to get into this to be able to, you know, kind of jump in and have all the information literally at their fingertips. So that's awesome. Uh, we'll Thank have to, you know, continually share about it. If you have anything that's going on with the book and you want us to share it on our page, just let us know and we'll, we'll be glad to get it out there. I probably want to tell Greg, you can tell me, but I'm, he's better at sharing than me. Um, I can hit the button that says share. I'm always busy and I'm like, oh, I don't have time. But um, because I'll be at work or whatever, and Greg doesn't do anything, he's at work. But uh, <laughs> hey, robots build vehicles. But yeah, we'd love to help get the word out and get the book in everybody's awesome. hands. So definitely want to thank you for coming on, though. And that will be a wrap for episode 345. We'll see y'all next week. Thanks.